Our next speaker who's just getting ready uh, is Steve Jordan. He's an associate professor at the University of Toronto Scarborough. Um, I, I've known Steve for uh, a little while now. Um, he is a fellow uh, instructor for his large introductory psychology course uh, at Scarborough. Uh, he's a very interesting uh, person. He, he easily has the most interesting title for a talk at this symposium. Uh, probably the most interesting hair. He plays in a rock band on the weekends and he rides a motorcycle. Basically everything I would like to do at some point in my life. Um, so his talk today uh, is titled Werewolves of Learning, Transforming a Very Large Class into a Fully Online Beast. And his uh, Infectious Psychology course is easily the most technically advanced course uh, on earth. And uh, I think we'll hear a little bit more about some of the technology and assessing it um, that goes into it. Please help. Welcome, Steve. Where will this lead? 
what impact will it have. Um, I don't worry about a lot of those things because there's one thing they said about their courses I really like. They said, we're going to decide which courses we fund, and when we say online, what we care a lot about are learning outcomes. So those of you who haven't heard about learning outcomes, I'll, I'll give you the, the version they like in schools, because I like it better, where they call it um, the six C's or the seven C's. One of them's content, okay? But then there's, we want to know how you're teaching critical thinking, creative thinking, communication, which can be both expressive and receptive, metacognitive skills, um, you know, all of these kinds of things, which are not content. They're about skills that the student's going to get. And so they say, we want to see how you're doing that because we want our online courses not only to deliver content, but also to make, uh, to, to train students to have these abilities, which will transfer all through their lives, often called transferable skills. I drank that Kool-Aid long ago. Um, and so if someone wants to link money to that Kool-Aid, I'm there, <laughs> I'm all over it. Uh, we'll have debates about where it's going to go, uh, but I'm not gonna let the debates or the, or the paranoia or the fear hold me back. So what do we mean by a fully online course? Um, I've already kind of let some of this cat out of the bag, but this is at least the U of T interpretation of what a fully online course has to be. Lectures have to be available online. You can have one traditional exam, one sit-down traditional exam at the end of the course that's cumulative and that's worth up to 50% of the grade. Okay, so they are going to ultimately sit down somewhere and write that final exam, but the rest of the grade has to be acquirable online. And they love things that focus on these learning outcomes, 21st century skills, six C's, whatever you want to call them, cognitive skills. Uh, so this is the, the sort of roadmap we're supposed to follow. Now at UT Scarborough, uh, we were kind of ahead of the game because a while ago, a long time ago, at the double cohort, we realized we had more students than we had classrooms to put them in. So we decided to be, be blended learning leaders because we couldn't put them in real spaces, so we had to use the virtual space. Uh, so long ago, with a colleague named John Basili, um, we, we created this thing called the web option. Option being a critical word, by the way. The way it works is very simple. I lecture, just like I am now. Well, it's, it's actually, we're doing it exactly right now. In, in the back, there's a camera person set up, although her camera's way better than the ones we use. We use crappy little handheld cameras on a tripod. There's a microphone that goes right from my lapel to the camera. Otherwise, I do nothing differently. I wander around just like you see, I talk just like I talk, but that lecture is put online later that same day. Students can now either physically attend the lecture or wait and watch it online. Their choice, uh, we now have an 1,800 student class that I teach and about 350 to 400 attend every lecture. Sometimes a different 350 to 400. So it's their option. If they feel they learn better in this way, then they can come to class. If they feel they learn better online, they can watch online. So we've been doing this for a long time. We already had that online lecture thing in the bag. I had also a while ago developed something called Peer Scholar. I'm gonna come back to Peer Scholar. Um, but it was already to encourage students to write, to think, to give feedback, to respond to feedback. Um, so I'll tell you a lot more about that in a moment, but we've been using this for quite some time. My first sort of foray into educational technology. That's 12% of the grade. So when we looked at that Ontario Online University stuff, we're like, okay, we're only 38% of the grade away from doing this already. Um, and so all we have to do is think about how to come up with those other 38%. So here's where we kind of were circa 2003. Um, we had uh, a midterm, a multiple choice, we had Peer Scholar, and we had the web option. That's sort of what the double cohort did to us. Okay, so now I want to get on a soapbox. I like soapboxes every now and then. I get really annoyed when I read all these articles and stuff that basically um, boil down to this. Large class equals bad class, period. Um, more students you have in class, the worse the educational experience. 
I don't think that has to be true. I think that often is true, but I don't think it has to be true. And in fact, I like to kind of fight that by saying, in my opinion, large and online classes will be the engine that will drive educational innovation. I think just like space, which yes, if you go to space, but you do everything like you will on Earth, it ain't gonna work very well, okay? But the cool thing about space is it's going to make you think about things differently. It's going to make you think about how can I be effective in that environment? And often, the things, the solutions you come up with are not only useful in that environment, but they're useful in the more traditional environments as well. Just to give you a taste of space, cordless drills, pacemakers, uh, memory foam, duct tape. How did we live without duct tape? I don't know. Um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Whoops, sorry. Um, all of these things were created to help astronauts function in space. All of these things get daily use in our personal lives today. So my argument is large and online classes can do the same thing for our education system. Trying to think how to make things work there will impact everything, potentially. I want to just go back to that other soapbox about skills versus content. Here's just a smaller list, but a list that's important to me. Uh, and I just want to relate this to memory research. Um, I, I, one, of, one of my sort of confused personalities is a memory expert um, somewhere. So I did a lot of memory research for a while. Uh, and one very simple distinction uh, is the distinction between memory systems we use to learn information and memory systems we use to learn skills. Information, we can learn by simple exposure, but skills we can't. My favorite example of this is, if you go to a one hour lecture on karate, you can learn a lot about karate in an hour. <coughs> You can learn the history, you can learn what the outfits are called, you can learn what all the moves are, etc., etc. If you want to learn to do karate, you cannot learn that in an hour. And you cannot learn that by having somebody tell you about it or by reading. You can only learn it by doing karate. Badly at first, but with repeated, effective practice, the skill develops. And the really cool thing is, if it develops enough, it becomes second nature, it becomes automatized. So that woman who's done a lot of karate, some guy grabs her from behind, she kicks his ass first and then figures out who he is second. You know, that's what you want from a, a good karate training. If we do a good job, if we can figure out how, we can make these skills second nature for our students so that they'll think critically automatically, think creatively automatically, etc. Okay, but, we have to do it differently. We can't just lecture. We can't just have them read a book. They have to get active. They have to get using these things. And they have to do it a lot. All right, so here's where I'm going to go. And I just want to tell you about some of these components along the way. Um, circa 2003, we were here already. Um, circa 2011, I flirted with these cool things. I thought I, I thought it was really clever. Um, getting Wikipedia assignments in their class, authentic assessment. Students loved it. They were very engaged. Wikipedia hated it. I almost had Toronto blocked out where nobody in Toronto could edit Wikipedia articles because of me and my class. Very humorous interaction. Um, sort of wasn't humorous at the time. I never had so many reporters calling me. Um, Google Jordans and Wikipedia if you actually care about that story, but I'll just say for now, I've retreated from Wikipedia. Um, I, I, I still think it's a great idea, uh, but me and Wikimedia, the group that runs Wikipedia, have agreed to cease and desist until we can work together in more functional ways, um, and then we'll come back and revisit this. So, Wikipedia has disappeared from the list, but you'll see that there's a couple of new things, MTuner and Digital Lab Code. Um, and of course, there's Pure Scholar kicking around. All right, so let's go through these. MTuner, thanks to the previous talk. Um, a lot of what I want to say about MTuner, you have the basics for. First of all, I'm going to learn thing, link things to learning outcomes. MTuner is mostly about content, but also about metacognitive skills and critical thinking. We hope students are going to get practice with those latter two as they focus on the first one. 
Basically what we did, and this is part of the story, this is supposed to be from the lab to the classroom. For, for us, it's a big circle in our lab. So everything we create is created based on the literature, but then we do research on it, usually in the classroom, once we've created it, and then hone it further based on that research. So for MTuner, it's all about assessment for learning. It's all about the testing of that, okay, that you've just heard about. Um, some of the good things about testing students. First of all, it's better than restudying, just as you just saw. So students, the testing and that retrieval practice they're getting enhances their learning. It's very good, better than restudying. That's cool. Um, more powerful than virtually any study strategy that's been identified. It is probably the best thing students can do or we can do for our students to help them learn material well. And it has a long-lasting effect getting to the spacing kind of thing. It tends to be a much more robust form of learning. That's cool. Here's the negative thing what you weren't told in the last talk. <laughs> Not really. But, for example, I want to link to that, that question here um, about the medical students with these cumulative tests. When I heard that, I went, ooh, that scares me a little bit. Because Tim Chang, who's here, his whole PhD thesis looked at what happens when somebody picks the wrong answer in a multiple choice test, right? We have all these false floors. And what happens is, if you test them again months later, and he's got a whole forgetting function, they persist in their wrong answers. The punchline is, they learn while they're being tested. They're never more engaged than they're being tested, than when they're being tested. What they pick, they associate with the question, whether it's right or wrong. If we don't tell them whether they're right or wrong, then they will learn these misconceptions. So things like multiple choice tests, are scary. If you have a 65% or 70% average on your test, essentially what you are doing as we push our students out the door is teaching them 30% misconceptions and saying off you go. That scares me, that keeps me awake at night. Um, so we want to try to use the benefits of the, the good stuff of testing and avoid the bad stuff. Um, yeah, let me just jump in. <laughs> Here's how an M-Tuner uh, test works. First of all, it is a multiple choice on steroids, in a sense. But the first way it works, and this is going to be really bleached out here, but uh, they get the question without alternatives. And they're asked to free recall the alternative, uh, free recall their answer to that. We don't actually do anything with this right now. But this is based on research that shows that the testing effect is strengthened if you have people do this first. Okay, if you, if, uh, it, if you don't, they default to recognition. They go right to the alternatives and try to find which one feels right. But if you put them in this situation for a while, now they try to think of what that right answer is. And the impact is actually startlingly dramatic. I don't necessarily believe the data because how large the effects are. It just in educational research is like, really? I don't know. But very large. So we do this to sort of set the stage every question. They generate something. They know it won't be part of the mark but they're also told this will enhance the power of this test to help you for the cumulative final. Remember that cumulative final, 50%. By the way, in my class, you must pass the final to pass the course. So the final is that big bad thing at the end of the course, the monster at the end of the book, if you will. Everything else is to prepare them for the final, really. So they see this, they see the alternatives, they pick one. If they pick the right one, then we tell them they're right, and um, we tell them why they're right. Every question will end with telling them what the right answer is and why they're right. Okay? The interesting stuff happens um, when they're wrong. If they choose wrong, then one of two things happens. If it was a question from the lecture, remember all of our lectures are videotaped, and see, I told you I'm confused. Who the hell is that guy? That's not me. Uh, same shirt. I don't know. Uh, but at any rate, if it was from the lecture, they actually get pushed back to the lecture. They get to watch the lecture where I'm talking about whatever concept is related to the question. They're not necessarily going to get the answer. We make sure that our multiple choice questions fit Bloom's hierarchy well, have all these different levels. So it's not like I'm just going to give them the definition. Sometimes it will, maybe. But whatever I say will be related to the content of the question. Or they get pushed to the ebook. 
with the same idea. Here's a page in the ebook. There's something here that's related to that question you're being asked. Check it out as long as you want. Return to the question, and you get a second chance for half marks. Okay? If you still don't get it right, then we tell you what's right, and we tell you always, we tell you why it's right. So every multiple choice question ends with them knowing the right answer and why it's right, and hopefully with them having chosen it um, at, at a fairly large rate. Marks are high on the M-Tutor. Um, I'll just throw that out there and leave that for you. Um, all right. Now, with respect to the research on the other side of things, let me just go to here and you can start looking at it. With most of our technologies, the way our research cycle works is the following. As we're first instituting, and by the way, I just use these in my class. 1800, I don't care. I, I usually say to the extent I have a skill, it's stomping on fires. Well, creating fires, and then stomping on fires. Um, so I, we just, we're pretty unabashedly, we just try things in the class. We're gonna do this, we have good reasons, we have good research backing up why we're doing this, this should work. Um, we're gonna do it, and we do it. And my class, for whatever reason, even though it's a different class every year, is very comfortable with that, very cool with that, we get a good rapport going, and we try stuff. Now the first few times when we try it, the data we're getting is typically more of a subjective nature. It's perceptions of learning, it's ease of use of the technology, it's that kind of thing. We want to know that the students are cool with what we're doing. And then we progress to more laboratory-based studies, looking at the actual impact on learning and, and such. M-Tutor is pretty new, so we're still at, at this uh, early stage. Digital lab book's also new. Peer Scholar's been around for a while. So I'll give you a taste of this. Um, this these are just some student reflections. You sort of read them yourself, uh, to a large extent they feel like they're learning a lot doing uh, M-Tuners. They feel generally like relative to a typical multiple choice they prefer M-Tuner in, in terms of preparing them for a final exam. Uh, how stressful is M-Tuner versus uh, a typical exam? Little less. They're not quite as freaked out by M-Tuners as they are by traditional exams. Part of which is that second chance and the knowledge that they'll probably get a decent mark. We ask them, what are the first three words you, you think of when I ask you about your M-Tuner experience? Um, messy little word cloud here, but you see it's kind of cool. Fun? A test? What the heck? Where's fun coming from? Interesting? Good? Learning? Um, helpful? You know, those are kind of nice. They're stressful there. They better be stressful there, I mean, to some extent. It is an exam, um, but we're getting, by and large, a very positive reaction from our students. They feel like this isn't just a test, it's, it's us trying to help them learn the material better. Okay, so that's a taste of M-Tuner. I'm going to give you a real quick taste of Digital Lab Code. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll almost say it this way, uh, other than flipping through some slides really quick. But this is, in a sense, what I did is I looked at Intro Psych and I said, what is the chapter that I teach that I think is critical, but students don't get as deeply as they really need to? Uh, and for me, that chapter was the scientific method. Okay, critical to your whole progress as a social scientist. Um, students learned things like confounding and third variables and whatever, but I wondered if they understood them. And so the idea here was, let's, Give them some active learning experience after they read the chapter that we hope will set that experience and really make it come to life. So it's essentially a simulator of research, obviously dumbed down to the point where, where we can make it work. So they basically provide data themselves through a questionnaire, and then they can analyze their own data to look for interesting or weird patterns. Okay, so they're going to learn about, throughout the process of this, data collection, hypothesis generation, statistical analysis, replication, theorizing about results. These are the things we're going to ask them to do really quickly. Phase one, we just ask them a bunch of silly questions. Any silly question we can think of. Um, do you own a cat? Which method of transit do you use? How many slices of pizza do you eat per week? We just come up with all these questions. Um, not, not real relevant, but fun. Fun is going to be sort of the core here. So they do that. They get a mark for doing that. Phase two. 
This is where they have to do some analyses. So really all of these analyses are correlations, although we disguise some of them as t-tests. They learn correlations, they learn t-tests in the book, uh, and so they can do an analysis. They can say, do males eat more pizzas than females? <coughs> do whatever. Is how much Harry Potter you, you read correlated with how much or little you date? Uh, that, that is the idea right there, you know, that they actually care about these things and they find them interesting. Um, do people with more tattoos drink more beer? Um, you know, whatever you want to ask. But that's what they do. They ask a question, they know what the variables are, they ask a question, they grab the variables, define what they're testing, it does the test for them, it shows them a scatter plot, you can't see it over here very well, but it shows them statistics. They don't have to do any of this. Although we're thinking about gamifying, where they can drag values so they start to kind of feel it more. But ultimately, and you can't see this at all, but they get a critical value and an obtained value, and they have to draw a conclusion from that. They are told you can do as many of these as you want, but there's going to be a Dave Letterman's top 10 list at the end. The top 10 most interesting or unexpected findings. So keep doing them, and if you want to try to get on that list, try to find something interesting, unexpected, that's obviously significant. Now, 1,800 students in the class, every analysis is only 200 data points, randomly selected. So next phase, real quick. They see a subset of the analyses other people submitted. By the way, they have to give their analysis a title that is both interesting and descriptive. We talked to them about the marketing of science and how you know, somebody like these could have a really cool finding that sort of laid dormant for a long time until somebody like Rodiger, who knows better how to market, comes along and says, hey, you gave me credit, that's cool. <laughs> uh, so that's important. So they see all these titles, they choose 10 to replicate. And when they replicate, they see the hypothesis the person was testing, new 200 data points are chosen, the result replicates or it doesn't. Uh, they have to answer a few very simple questions, so we can markify this a little bit. Um, and how interesting the result is, they rate. And then finally, the theorized step. They literally see these top 10 results that replicated at least 80% of the time. I just realized I'm making your life difficult, aren't I? A little bit. They replicate at least 80% of the time and that were rated as highly interesting by the students. So we're kind of crowdsourcing a lot of these measures. Like, we didn't do anything, by the way, the students are just driving all of this process. And we find, you know, results like this. Um, some of them are actually pretty easy, right? Blonde students speak significantly less language than black-haired students. Anybody want to provide a theoretical hypothesis about that? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, but that's their chore here. They do one of two things. There's 10 of these results. They either provide a unique theoretical hypothesis for one of them. If they think they have a hypothesis that's not already in the list, they can provide one unique theoretical hypothesis and they're done. If they can't think of one for any of the 10, then they can upvote what they think is the best hypothesis in all 10. So they have to do 10 votes that way. So what we end up with are these 10 interesting results with the most upvoted theoretical hypothesis. Again, all of this just meaning to get them in that spirit of what we all do all the time. And I'll give you one final thing. We found that um, people with larger feet are less worried about technology. <laughs> Anybody want to seriously give a go at that? Why, why do you think that is? Yeah. Yeah. To, to gender third variable. So males have bigger feet. Males are more comfortable with technology. So they read about third variables. They can recite the definition of third variables, but when we can now revisit this and say, see, this is a third variable, uh, then they get it. And, and that's the idea, to make them get this stuff. Okay. That's digital lab coat in a nutshell. Um, real quick, just to give you a sense, in a much better uh, idea of the scientific process, the blue is the agree, so most people are agreeing. Um, in a clear sense, the role statistics plays, we want them to understand why we're going to make them do a stats course. So, we want them to get a feel for that. They largely agree with that. Um, this is kind of an interesting one. I did the very least I had to do to complete the step uh, steps. So a lot of people disagree with that. They're saying, no, no, I did, I did more than I had to do, um, which is kind of cool. I don't feel quite as worried about taking a course in statistics. 
Um, I don't know why the green dis disagree isn't there, but at any rate, do you see that we're getting some people, I don't know what the base rate is of this would be if we had asked it without digital lab code. Um, I don't think there would be as much agreement with this, but again, we don't know. Finally, where, where, are, where am I at for time? One minute? Jeez. Oh, Fierce dollar. Um, I, I will give you a report for this, but I want to get really, ah, this is not good. I want to leave time for this. Fierce dollar is what we call the multivitamin of learning objectives. Any learning objective you want to exercise, you can, and we very cockily now say, and we can also assess these learning outcomes. Um, Here's the, well, you guys all know this anyway. Anyone who's published knows this. So think of yourself publishing, but think of what we do to students now. First step, they have to submit something. It can be any digital composition, but let's say it's a writing assignment. So they submit an argument. Second step, they log in and they assess the submission by a subset of their peers. So they're now reviewers, and they're reviewing a bunch of submissions and they're giving assessments Specifically, the most important thing is they are telling their peer the one thing that they think their peer should, should improve to maximally impact the quality of the work, and they give them some sense of how to go about that improvement. We ask for the most critical thought, what's the biggest problem, and creative thought, how would you solve it? You have to communicate those two things to your peers, and we're going to grade you on the basis that, what the heck just happened? Slides. This is what happens when you use your student slides. Um, step three. Step three. They see the feedback from their peers. This is like when we get our reviewer feedback back, and we're and they're asked to go through each review of their work and rate how useful it was. Step four. They revise and resubmit, and part of their revision includes what in peer scholar we call a reflection piece, what you or I would call a letter to the editor. You must justify the changes you made and the changes you did not make. So show us you read the feedback carefully and that you tried your best to think deeply about it and respond to it appropriately uh, and do that. And wow, I just want to give you one taste of a cool thing. We're going to claim with Peer Scholar not only that we exercise all these things, but that we can assess them quantitatively in the context of the assignment. So critical thinking, you don't need some critical thinking test. You don't need to do something at the end of your program. You don't need whatever. Every assignment students do, you can assess their critical thinking abilities. Very cocky, even more cocky when you see how simply we do it. We're trying to stir a hornet's nest and getting other people into this game. So here's the idea. We want to see how good I am at critical thinking. I assess, let's say, Sue, and I give a grade, and they, they, you can't ask them to give a grade. Um, I don't just, while I'm doing this to Sue, sorry about the graphics, other peers are doing it to Sue. And, that, sound, that sounded wrong, um, especially because my wife is Sue, so it's really sad. Um, but at any rate, um, those of you who minds weren't there, my apologies. Um, we also, by the way, have experts assess the work of Sue. I'll be more careful. As we go. So we can compare, we can either use the average of peers, which myself and my graduate student Dwayne showed that as long as you have five or six peers, that average is as good as a TA mark. That's something you can challenge me on if you, if you like. Um, so you can look at the difference between my mark and the average peer mark, or you can look at the difference between my mark and an expert grade. I didn't just grade Sue, I graded a bunch of other people too. So we can look at the difference between the grades I'm giving and the grades other people are giving, these other grades we hope reflect a good expert uh, grade, and we can simply ask, how close am I coming? How well am I nailing the grade that an expert would give to this piece? Our cocky claim is, we think that reflects critical thinking, because what's the expert grader doing? When, it try, when they try to figure out what's an eight and what's a seven, they're comparing, they're contrasting, they're evaluating, they're doing all the verbs that we link with critical thinking. It all results in a grade. So we can use these grades, we claim, to do this. And I just wanted, this will be the last bit of stuff I show you. I just want to show you that we do come around to more cognitive psychology kind of experiments. So what I'm showing you here is these scores, first of all, are the difference score. So a smaller difference score means they're coming closer to the experts. So think of it like an error score. 
All right. Um, first two bar bars represent part one of the course. Second bar represents part two. So there were two assignments in part one, one assignment in part two. People can take part two without taking part one. That's the blue bar. So the orange bars, what these are, are people who've done three of these three scholar assignments. Different topics, different whatever, but three assignments. And what you see is they're coming closer and closer to the grade the expert is giving them. Or the way I want to claim it, we are developing the critical thinking abilities. And we're able to measure this and track this and it's behaving like we would expect. These people in the blue, first ever peer scholar assignment, they've been in university just as long as these guys, um, but first ever assignment, and we see a significant difference there. Um, so, you know, again, we want to claim that they're getting this experience, and I think I'm just going to stop there, and that it's actually enhancing their critical thinking abilities. We can measure it, we can assess it. It behaves just like it would if you were exercising a muscle where you would see um, the strength grow over time. <laughs> okay, shut up. I think we can have time for just a question or two uh, from the audience before we move on to our final talk. Um, one question I, I might ask you, Steve, is that, so obviously this is a very uh, tech-heavy course, a lot of different tools. I'm wondering uh, if there's a point at which you might, it could be overwhelming for a student. It's, like, it's um, overwhelming for me, so. <laughs> yeah. And the other question is, um, we, we saw from Barb's talk that there might be differences in age. So if there was an older uh, age group that was taking a course like this, do you think that there might be differences as well? Yeah, so first of all, that, that, to that first point, it's perhaps even more extreme than you might have got the impression. His peer scholar has, as you got the impression, three phases. Digital lab code has four phases. There's four different M tuners through the, the course, so let me do a quick math in my head. That's about 11 due dates in a 12-week course where something is due all the time. Uh, and so absolutely, students have to keep track of this. They have to know it. They have to use it. The technology doesn't bother them at all. They love it. Like just about everything in ours, if we say, should this be in other courses, they say yes. The due dates are, are tricky because you're going to have a lot of issues with the due dates. I'm very strong on, we're going to treat you like grown-ups. You have little smartphones, put these due dates in your smartphones now. If you miss them for no good reason, you get zero on that component. Uh, but, it, but it does, you know, you have to be tough like that. And that, that's the biggest, I think, grief. So we're going to now make an excuse system. That's the next one where you can ask for something to be redone, but you have to give a good critical thinking argument, and if it's above a certain bar, then we'll consider giving you some options. This is another option, and students will always work really hard when they think they might get a chance at a regrade. So we're gonna try to harness that. All right. One question. One you can question. just yell at it, I get right here. Um, I, I don't even know if this is a school post any research that you've done, but by facilitating, I mean, you're, talking about pretty much somebody sitting behind a computer and experiencing an entire course behind a computer. And, you know, um, I'm of the opinion that a large part of education and university education is the ability to interact with people and the ability to have to approach your professor and your PA and say, I need help with this concept. Now, I know with such a large class size, it's difficult to facilitate that all the time. But at least to the extent where at some point there's some sort of interaction. So I don't know if you can comment on that. Absolutely. So yeah, this is a fascinating and hotly debated issue because it's really complex. So for example, if I have just traditional office hours in my course, I will get very few people coming, and it will tend to be the same people over and over. If I offer online office hours, I get way more. So way more people are willing, way more students are willing and comfortable to do that, but they're lacking that one-to-one -one experience. So there's one question, well, what's worse? Just making them avoid it altogether and then they don't get the information or the experience? But here's our notion at, at Scarborough that we're working on so far. First and second year courses are huge. They're just huge. There doesn't seem to be a way around them. So first and second year courses, we're gonna rely very heavily on technology to develop a base of these skills. Let me just give you a taste of that. With a smartphone next fall, rather than having students do written assignments in Peer Scholar, they're gonna shoot little videos where they're giving oral, uh, arguments, basically. It's not the same as what I'm doing right now, there's not the social pressure, but if we can get them used to that process in their first two years, now in third and fourth year when classes get smaller, now only in-person office hours, much more direct in-class 
experiences. So that's sort of our notion is that right now it looks like a lot of first and second year courses have stripped all this away, which is really bad. We want to get experience in using technology, but we acknowledge we have to get that personal experience in there as well. Um, but that's what we're going to do more later.